hope you guys can hear me. Thank you very much for attending and welcome, welcome. So uh, before we begin, I will just introduce myself to those who are already on the floor. Uh, my name is Marissa and I am from HCHRDC. I will be today's moderator. Okay, so I will just um, share my screen for now. And 28, we still have two minutes left. All right, so before we begin, I will just um, play this video. again so now we have around 60 pets um, already in the floor and i'm sure that the numbers will keep rising okay um so we will begin shortly with uh, today's live webinar is with mr lee Coxon from omron electronics in glimmer heart so while uh, before we start um, to all who are already in here do grab a cup of coffee feel free to grab a leaf um, beverage all right and a very good morning to all so once again my name is marissa and i will be today's moderator all right so we will just be uh, now that it's already 10 30 we will not waste any time so we will just jump right into it but before that i would like to remind you guys to um, a few housekeeping rules okay so today's um, session is expected to last around one hour uh, plus minus and for any Q&A, uh, for any questions, please utilize the chat box. Um, I'm sure you guys can see the chat box um, option on your screen. So do type your questions and we will address them towards the end of the session during Q&A. Okay, and please ensure that your mic is muted um, during the presentation so that there will be no interruptions for our speaker. And there will be a poll question also towards the end of the session. It's just like a simple, a very, a very simple um, feedback. So we will appreciate you guys to stay until the end. All right. And for your recommend, uh, recommended viewing is a side-by-side -side or speaker view. Okay, and the raise hand reaction during the webinar will regrettably will not be attended due to the limited time that we have. And just a reminder to all that this is a recorded webinar session and we will be taking a random few screenshots throughout the session. And this recorded session also uh, will, will be able for you guys to view um, on our YouTube channel, all right? It's ready. All right, so this is the interesting part that we from SHRDC has provided and will provide for you guys today. So to all attendees uh, for this webinar today, you guys will receive a webinar e-badge. All right, so this will be sent via email, um, the same email that you guys registered for today's session. So this will be sent after um, the webinar session ended, okay? But to, in order for you to receive this, please make sure to stay until the end of the session. Okay, so without further ado, so I'm sure you guys already know who our speaker of the day, our guest speaker for today. So he is Mr. Lee Coxon from Omar Electronic Syndrome the Heart, and he is currently serving as the general manager in sales, channel management, support, and service um, for Omar. Okay, so if you guys can see here, this is actually, uh, as you guys can see, it's actually quite a, a list of the things that he has. Um, um, his career, his journey, um, so I to say. Okay, so he is a graduate uh, from Curtin University, Australia, um, in mechanical engineering. Okay, and currently he is serving as the general manager at Omron Electrics, and he, you can see that he has a vast experience in his um, in this field. All right. 
So, um, but I'm sure Mr. Lee himself would be best to introduce himself um, in what when what he does best. And so he will be speaking on smart manufacturing and capacity. So once again, my name is Marissa. And if there's any questions at all or any inquiries and concerns, any issues throughout this presentation or this webinar, do type them into the chat box and we will help you out. Okay. So for now, I will just stop sharing my screen. So Miss Lee, um, you are you can take the floor. You can take the session away from here. Let's welcome Ms. Um, Ms. Daly. Oops, sorry. Um, no worries. And you can, cannot see my screen. Uh, yes, we can. You're on the Excel sheet. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Now can see, right? Uh, yes. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, uh, I hope everyone is safe. It's a bit strange uh, for me to do a seminar in a webinar like this because the biggest problem is I cannot see your face. I cannot have... Uh, I prefer to speak in live crowd so that I can see the reaction of people and, uh, uh, and the interaction. So uh, it's okay if I along the way I speak. If you have question, you want to interrupt me, it's okay, it's fine. Yeah? You, if you're too shy about uh, typing a message, uh, then just ask me straight away um, your, your, uh, your, your, your concern, your interest. Yeah? So today, uh, I talk a little bit about smart manufacturing and some of the trends. It's not a typical industrial 4.0 uh, technical stuff. Uh, it's more about uh, sharing of experience and what we have seen throughout these years and what we can expect uh, coming in the uh, in the coming years. So a little bit about myself. I think uh, Melissa just uh, mentioned something. Okay, this is my journey. Uh, spent quite a number of years uh, in the industry. I think coming to 29 years already, uh, mainly in the factory automation. A uh, big uh, chunk of my time I spent in Festo with different uh, positions. Uh, nevertheless, it's still in the same industry, uh, automation. Um, today, my talk, Basically, I have three, um, three topics. Number one is a little bit about Omron. So uh, I have to share a bit about what we do uh, because what I am talking will have a uh, implication of what uh, about this um, um, trend. Yeah? Later, I just mentioned a little bit about technology. So if you are here to, oh, my, my background is off. Sorry, let me mind. Uh, uh, why is it like that? Okay, you see my office, Amesa? Uh, yes, I'm actually seeing your office background. Mm, why is my, how come my background just I think, I think you might have pressed something accidentally. So. Oh, let me. Uh, you can just right click and choose the virtual background. Where is the virtual background? Okay. Um, well, you have to right click on your own screen and then there should be a virtual background option. Uh, Manada. It was okay just now, right? Under the video, is it? Sorry, yeah. Uh, bear in mind, uh. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Lee, but uh, I think the background is not an issue, so you can just oh, all right. Okay. So now you're back on. <laughs> Sorry all for right, the uh, interruption. So a little bit about yeah. Omron. Um. So Omron has been around for about 80 years. So we are, we are in the sensing and control business. Um, actually only back in 90, we were created as a Tateishi electric uh, manufacturing company. Um, but only in the 1990 was renamed uh, to Omron. If you are interested, this uh, picture here is the, our head office in, uh, in Kyoto. Yeah. So what we do uh, about 
more than 50, just over 50% our business is in industrial automation. Uh, we have several business units. So uh, I myself is under uh, industrial automation business. We call it the short form IAB. Uh, but most people only remember us, uh, if it's not industry, they only know us as a healthcare pressure pump, you know, um, uh, producer. But then, anyway, we are also in the uh, power, uh, solar power generation, some of the pieces from there, uh, social system, like uh, electronic, mechan electronic and mechanical components. This is, uh, uh, these are factories that we make some of the relays and stuff. Uh, this uh, factory in Sungai Wei is making a relay. Yeah, it's under the EMC uh, business unit. Okay. Um, probably some of you don't understand a little bit of background about Omron. Actually, we uh, started the solid state product back in 1960. So the first solid state is actually from Omron. If you are taking MRT uh, frequently, then you know that there is an unmanned train station. Actually, the first unmanned train station system was also from Omron back in 1967. Uh, so uh, nowadays you use all this uh, tech and all this RFID stuff, though, but the uh, beginning, all this ticketing system from Tokyo is from Omron. Then we have uh, like the online uh, cash dispenser, your ATM machine, yeah? You can see back in the 71, uh, Omron started this, yeah? Then we have other things like pressure meter. So there's a, a long history. Omron is uh, 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 in the innovation of uh, uh, this kind of uh, products, uh, automation, yeah, for human, um, uh, for the society. Uh, the inventor, okay, why I want to bring up this, uh, because it's Kusatsu, Kusam, uh, Kasuma Tadeishi, uh, he's the founder of Omron. Uh, he already passed away around the age of 90. Um, um, he's, uh, he likes to uh, create things and in, uh, contribute to the society. Uh, why I want to bring up him because of this. Back in 1970, uh, he created this theory called the Scenic Theory. Scenic stands for seed, innovation, need, impetus, uh, cyclic evolution. This, this cycle, he presented this in 1970 in the uh, International Future Research Conference. So at that time, he already see this. I will show this diagram later. The scenic theory, what it means is, uh, if you look at, uh, before any changes come, always the science, I mean, this is more around, uh, along the line of technology. Um, first, must start from science, okay? Somebody created something, invented something, but then that science will take some time because the technology is not ready. But the science uh, will sow the seed, for the technology. So uh, technology will start to make it better and better. And until one day, the technology able to create some innovation to meet the society needs. And therefore that change uh, society in a bigger way. Then the society start to evolve, then it has different needs, right? The, in, the, the society um, will say, oh yeah, I, not, I need more of this and then, then they demand a change in technology and then technology, oh, the science is not ready. If it goes back to technology, the science is not ready. So they have to think about a new way of science. And then this, this cycle just go around, around and throughout mankind, we have this diagram. So we see uh, at the beginning of mankind, you have primitive society, uh, collective society, agriculture society, handicraft. So from handicraft society, is where we see the industrial revolution, huh? uh, one and two and three, and now it's uh, industrial revolution, fourth, the fourth one. So along the way, you can see things, uh, uh, the science, the science will trigger the handy, uh, the, the technology, the technology become mature. This will push the society from one stage to the other. So at the moment, we are somewhere here, cyber nation, somewhere here, and we are moving towards uh, optimization society and in the future, uh, there's some more on, this is what he sees, um, he saw at the time, uh, autonomous society and so on. Oh, a little bit hard to comprehend this. Let me show you one example. We all aware of this, which is the internet. The science of internet, you have to backdate to around 1950s, you know, 
actually it started in in the early 90s uh, this um, Nicholas uh, um, Tesla he he dreamed back in the 19 1900 uh, in the future communication with wireless that was the dream right but then it never come until 1950s uh, then somebody started to invent something to communicate then this uh, ARPANET project started. Actually, the ARPANET project was a military project. So the time they want to see how to send electronic message, how to package it. But it was that that science itself was just uh, spinning around. You know, in the fifties, in the sixties, they're still doing a lot of research. It's not ready yet. At that time, probably I was born in nineteen sixty nine. So at that time, everything is still very primitive. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I belong to the generation X, so I, I come from a generation where I experienced the most technology change, yeah, uh, from black and white TV to now LCD, a lot away, along the way, you can see a lot of uh, changes in technology, handphone, the size of Tupperware, you know, until today, flat screen, it's a lot of changes, but it was not, um, it was not until the World Wide Web, WW is ready, was ready back in 1990s, in the 90s, early 90s, right? Then there was the born of in the internet today, right? Um, but the journey was the science struggling with technology, still not ready, not ready, not ready. Then in the 90s, boom, comes internet. Before, we were still sending fax machine, you know, fax, teletext, and all these things, they communicate with OOC, uh, a client, uh, we still need to use a phone to dial. But in the late 90s, internet started to um, be more, more popular. But what changes that uh, the, so the society, the time uh, computer was ready, still not there yet. But what changes it better? And then a person called uh, Steve Job comes in and then he created a new technology and really changed the society. In the, if you look back, if you, are, uh, if you are older generation, uh, in, um, you can see that uh, in the past, there is no such thing of, you know, Google and all this stuff. We still have to go to library and do research. Everything was very manual. And until today, there's a vast difference. So that, that brings me to a point of this slide. Oops. The only constant in life is change. Life itself, uh, especially in the last few decades, uh, uh, there's constant uh, uh, evolution and change because of technology. The society itself is very, very dynamic. So we cannot say, uh, I'm here now, I'm comfortable and I don't want to change. If you are in a business, you think this way, then you'll be out of business very soon. So we have to uh, understand that um, the only thing in life that don't change is change itself, right? Everything keeps changing. So we must adapt to it. If you look at the, our modern society, our current situation, the three things that are affecting us. Number one, climate change, environmental change. There's a lot of pressure in the uh, generation, um, the millennium and the generation Z, they are more concerned about the earth, the environment right, then the uh, baby boomers, you know, baby boomers are all the re people who retired or, or um, uh, they, they, they are more concerned about uh, income, you know, wealth, but the younger generation, they have more concern about climate change. So there's a the environmental, uh, it's changing, it's getting worse, right, uh, global warming and stuff. Of course, the, the, so the social, the society also changed because we have an aging population in some advanced country, you see like Japan and Europe and, and uh, this country, uh, people are getting older. So they have a shortage of skill level. Uh, people are aging. So we have a, 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 this kind of a problem. And then globalization, um, manufacturing uh, start to, uh, gro this globalization, I will talk a little bit about that later. Uh, the supply chain is very globalized now. So the thing you buy now, because of some factory in some Indonesia or Taiwan shut down due to COVID, then you affect the supply chain. See, everything is now interlinked. Then of course, on the technology front, now it's like robotic, we're talking about AI, IOT and stuff like that. 
So all these three come together, I can assure you the thing will constantly change, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to learn about the new things and how we want to adapt to it. And I want to um, talk about the trend in the automotive industry. This is a very interesting uh, uh, driving uh, uh, engine to, uh, to change. The environment is the key driving factor for this uh, automotive industry. And all the countries in the world, the advanced country, they already set very tight deadline to reduce carbon emission, right? China, they have a very, uh, very urgent uh, deadline policy. Uh, America, they have some. Europe, of course, and Japan, and so on. Some of the countries, they try to bring down uh, carbon emission from vehicle. And therefore, because of that policy change, because uh, global warming and all this stuff, that push the car industry to move, to evolve. Uh, in the 19, in the 1900, you see the Model T from Ford after the second uh, uh, industrial revolution, the production method. So car manufacturing comes in, um, then it evolved, better car. Then, in, then comes the Prius uh, from Toyota, uh, this uh, hybrid engine, right? And now we're talking about Tesla. But the, because of that environmental change uh, pressure, um, the electric vehicle is getting, uh, uh, is growing more, you know? So in the future, we can expect more, more and more. It's just that Malaysia is a little bit behind. Uh, our and, uh, Malaysia National Automotive Policy uh, has not sufficiently addressed uh, the EV because the EV, uh, to move on to, to fully EV, there's still some obstacles. We still lack a tipping point. I mean, globally, I don't talk about Malaysia. Globally, we still have some tipping point. It's, we have not reached uh, the threshold. We have not passed that threshold yet. There is a concern on infrastructure, right? Uh, where, where, uh, if you drive an electric vehicle, uh, where do you charge it? Is there enough charging station? The battery does it have enough range, right? It's now modern car, 500, 600, five to 800 kilometer range but battery uh, maybe around 300. So how can they increase the battery capacity? How about the charging time? If you want to go to Penang and you can stop in Epo for three hours just to charge your battery, it's not going to happen. Yeah, the technology, the, 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 the change is not going to tip over. How about the cost, right? And how about after eight to nine, uh, 10 years, uh, the battery, where you're going to get rid of the battery? So does it recycling? Uh, issue will also come in and of course some policies are from the government also uh, very critical to drive this. So we still have some obstacles but but nevertheless the the the, uh, the landscape is changing in the automotive industry so we have to be aware of this. What we can see is that uh, currently the supply chain uh, in the automotive industry the car manufacturer is on top. The typical tier one, tier two, tier three uh, supplier, for example, uh, like Bosch, right? Continental, maybe they make some tires, they make some dashboard and all this stuff, Valio, Denso, Aircon, TRW, ABS, and all this stuff. Then there are the uh, supplier that make the electronics like from Infineon, Freescale, all this. Uh, then some material supplier, uh, pain or, or, or adhesive as well. This is a typical landscape now. But in few years time, this will change because of the change in the car, uh, uh, the demand because of the push factor from environment, electric electrification uh, projects and all these things. In few years time, this is the demography of automotive industry will continue along, we call the KCSE, connectivity, autonomous, right? sharing, uh, electrification. So now the everything around this, along this uh, development in car industry is along this way of KCA uh, SD case. Uh. So um, in years to come, you will see um, new supplier, for example, service, service supplier, you now have this like, um, uh, Uber, you know, so in the, this is called a share service, right? You know, sharing subscription service. So they are talking about 
I don't own a car, you know, I share a car and what, and I need a car, I just call the car comes, right? Maybe the car comes is an autonomous car, we, we don't know, you know, it will change, but definitely it's along this line. Uh, the software provider is coming in as another, um, uh, another tier of uh, this uh, 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 supplier under car manufacturer. Uh, that's why now you, uh, you buy a car, you are asking, got Apple CarPlay or not, you know? Uh, can, can my car connect to my Android phone or not? So this is now the demand. In 20 years ago, you were talking about the car has ABS or not, you know, that's it. You know, yeah. Oh, I have ABS airbag, it's good enough. But nowadays you pop into the car, you want to buy a new car, you're asking, got Apple CarPlay or not? Uh, you, you are checking a car, uh, you said got autonomous braking or not? Automatic brake, got the level one, level two autonomous uh, drive or not? So I think the, the uh, Proton X50 has this function, right? So you'll be getting more and more popular. If this car you buy, you don't have this, then probably it's not something that you, you'll be interested in. So this, this demography of the automotives will change. But because more and more electronics, all these things I'm talking about are not mechanical, you know, the, the, uh, the, the aluminum block and all this. No, no, no. We are talking about electronic stuff. So what is driving the automotive industry currently a lot to do with electronics, right? So if you look at your car now, oops. If you look at car now, a typical car, you have a lot of sensors and gadgets in your car. A sensor, the sensor for um, uh, uh, your car, you, you, you sit on your car and uh, uh, asking you to fasten your seatbelt because there's a sensor under your seat. And by the way, this sensor is, pro this, uh, there's a company in Pekan producing this sensor, yeah? Uh, vacuum smarts, I think called, yes. They make these sensors. And then you have sensors or uh, uh, your ultrasonic sensor in front uh, for parking, you know, uh, braking and, and, and pressure sensor for tires and autonomous uh, sensor. This kind of thing is getting more and more in your car. That's why when there's a chip shortage in somewhere in Malaysia or something uh, cannot supply the chip, now a lot of car factory in America, they cannot produce a car because of this tiny stuff, because of electronics. And moving, that, that is only a standard car with internal combustion engine. Huh? Then we come to an electric car, right? Electric car, um, apart from the battery technology, um, you have like, because everything is drawing power from the battery. Yeah? So they have to start to think, um, there's a lot of converters in the car, yeah? uh, uh, motors and, and, and your, your environmental control. Uh, in your car, uh, they have to be very efficient, right? energy saving, because every every uh, every kilowatt of power you draw is just going to drain the battery because you drain the battery and then the range that define the range, uh, 300 kilometer, 400 kilometer, it will be shortened. So if you you buy an electric car now, uh, I think some uh, like I think the Nissan had Leaf and. Uh, Tesla, this car, the fully electric car, right? So you, you, you have to plan your journey well, right? Because along the way, if the sun is hot, you turn on the aircon uh, stronger, then you deplete the battery faster. So you got to plan very well. Uh, it's not like a petrol car as convenient, but because of all these electronic, you can see the demand uh, for like lighting and, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, even people are talking about in a future car, uh, uh, the environment will change, not just about the air con, right? The environment, there'll be some tiny LED, they're talking about this concept. In your car, there's some LED on the roof, right? So when you enter the car, you uh, have been uh, uh, going through a very tiring day. You say, oh, I want a seaside view. Then the whole, the whole thing will change to a, a sky, a bright day or sea view. They're talking about this kind of concept. So more and more electronics will go into our uh, vehicles in the future. So because of that, especially anything on uh, drive assist, uh, because of safety, you will notice that in the car, anyone is doing um, product for car, uh, uh, 
along this uh, electronic stuff, more and more are asking for zero defect. Zero defect is not just about uh, having better QC. No, it has a lot to do with the supporting structure like your, your system, your manufacturing infrastructure, your zero defect technology, uh, your software and etc. So um, there are companies uh, making some product for consumer. So if you buy a uh, computer or something screen, uh, it break down, it won't die, you see? But if your braking sensor malfunction, the car cannot break, you have an accident. So in US, this kind of small sorting of accident, especially uh, concerning life, you can get lawsuit. That's why um, they are very strict in the automotive sector. And therefore, a lot of pressure put into the manufacturing of automotive electronics to have zero defect, right? The computer fail, it won't die. But when the brake fail, you can get lawsuit. So some uh, like Takada airbag case uh, in the in US and you get uh, so many recalls and I think it bankrupt the company. So things like that. So they are very particular uh, in, uh, along this uh, line. So a lot of people probably ask, uh, Malaysia, anyone produce electric vehicle? Unfortunately, uh, no. So our industry that I know of uh, so far is more along the production of electrics. These are this kind of company already been here for a long time, like Infineon, like Osram, and and, and, and of course the Valio and this kind of company. Uh, they are a, a, some of them a big portion of the businesses into uh, more and more into automotive electronics and therefore their demand for as you can see zero defect manufacturing talk about zero defect technology so they do not want human they want to take human up from the equation no more human because a human maybe in any factory you have people transporting goods from one location to the other so uh, maybe that day he had a bad night and the night before bad night had a fight with the wife so he pushed the trolley too hard and it damaged some of the especially things like uh, you know a wire bond right after bond is very fragile right? so you can damage some of the lead frame the bonding and all this stuff right so there's more and more requirement to take the human out from the equation it's really like clean room right you have more human you have this uh, particle human uh, particle so they want to take the human out from the equation so to make the product uh, more controllable, everything consistent. Therefore, they can eliminate this kind of uncertain uh, uh, impact. So um, along the line, uh, more and more automation you can find into this sector relate to automotive industry. Yeah. So here is one example uh, I want to show you. Um, about EV production, um, we have one customer producing electric e vehicles are becoming more and more popular. Sorry, uh, we have one customer that doing um, uh, pro battery production, EV battery. Okay, but because we have uh, agreement with them, I cannot. Sh I don't. I, I cannot review much. So I show this video. Uh, I downloaded from uh, YouTube which is very similar, but it's a factory from China, but very similar technology uh, that what we did. So we supply quite a number of robots to this company and uh, the our customer is in uh, in US. So I, I just want to show to you because uh, the battery production is very, can, can be uh, easier in a way that uh, the assembly process, it can have a lot of robotics and all this stuff, right? So, uh, of course, you have, uh, in the end, you have some human just to do some uh, last minute cable fastening. This one you can avoid. Uh, but will be uh, very different from what you see in current uh, factory, Porton or Produa. It's, it's a bit different, yeah? So let me run the video quickly. Popular these days. And one of the essential elements of this automotive revolution is the battery. The battery used in electric vehicles has five main component parts, the module, the electrical system, the battery management system, the thermal management system and the structural parts. So, how do we build a state-of-the-art electric vehicle battery? Let's visit the SAIC Motor Battery Plant to find out. 
this industry-leading factory, a joint venture between Saic Motor and Cartil, can produce more than 300,000 electric vehicle batteries per year, to the highest European standards. The production line uses automated guided vehicles, as part of its high-tech manufacturing execution system. A high level of automation ensures that the batteries are constructed with consistency and high quality. Placed onto the AGV, the casing is designed to be strong but lightweight, enabling the battery pack design to be slim and high density. Next, the coolant hose, cold plate and thermal pad are combined into the thermal management system. This helps to keep the battery at the optimum operating temperature. The battery modules are stored in an automatically managed warehouse, they're delivered through air logistics automatically and accurately, exactly when needed. Robots are used to place the modules into the casing with great precision. The bolts are automatically tightened by the robots. For the next step, the air tightness of the water cooling system is confirmed. After that, it's time to install the high and low battery monitor to ensure the safety of using high voltage electricity. Adding flame retardation and safety. After the installation of the cover by the operator, it's automatically tightened by the robots. An air tightness test ensures that the battery pack is dust proof and waterproof. The OL offline test. Okay, I want to stop here. Um, <clears throat> all these, uh, um, the, the project that we did uh, actually use um, for the, there are two modules and the smaller one, uh, smaller modules are carried with the smaller robots and the assembly, uh, fully assembled battery uh, unit will be a bigger robot. So this kind of project uh, is what you see in this uh, video, uh, the one we did, uh, uh, we, we supply to a customer, they did this kind of integration. It's very similar with big industrial robots and, and mobile robots. It's very similar. So uh, the, the, the car industry um, uh, has changed. Yeah. So along this uh, line uh, of EV, uh, there are more the different uh, technology will, be, uh, will change. So we have to adapt to that. So this is so much so on the automotive side. Uh, more on the battery uh, electronics i will not mention too much next i want to talk about the trend in about this uh, glove industry so we we heard a lot about uh in the pandemic the glove uh industry uh are booing very well and 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 they they are shortage shortage i cannot supply in time so over the time what we can expect is uh, beyond uh 2022 Right. Of course, uh, this, this forecast was done before, it was done by Frost and Sullivan from the Frost and Sullivan report. Uh, actually, probably this is, could be higher because the pandemic is not over yet. So the demand of glove is still very high. But if the once the pandemic subsides, I'm not so sure whether we can, with the um, emerging emergence of uh, Delta variant, Lambda variant, I don't know what other variant will come. I'm not sure this how long would prolong, but from, from this point of view, we can see that the glove demand will still be very strong. But however, the glove price has peaked and start to flatten off. Yeah. Okay. So when, when the glove price are high and then this glove maker, if you happen to buy the glove stock, you make money like hell uh, if you sell it uh, early enough. All right. But um, uh, they anticipate that the price already came down. So the, 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 the share price also come down. Uh. But nevertheless, nevertheless, if you look detail into glove industry, the several costs that you uh, is already fixed. For example, the 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 pie chart on the right side. Uh, if you look at the rubber latex material, if you're doing nitrate, then the nitrate price is pretty much a standard thing. Yeah, you cannot just raw material price. You you need uh, of course the latex. Huh? you need fuel. Yeah. Uh, because you want, you need to fire the the oven to cure to dry the glove. So you need fuel. So uh, of course you need water. So it's here not mentioned about water. See, if you want to set up a glove factory, uh, you need to have uh, uh, water. You need to have fuel. Fuel. Uh, Malaysia has an advantage because of our natural gas. 
So you imagine you are, are having a group production in somewhere that you don't have all these things, your cost will be very high. So taking out all these chemical uh, costs and fuel costs and natural labor costs, um, because this is pretty much a, a flat for everyone, yeah, a competition one from the other. So the only thing left for a factory to be more cost effective is to um, look at the operation excellence. That means how can you reduce your overhead costs, your labor, your packaging costs. These are some of the area you, you have to look at uh, to, to decide if worth doing uh, further automation or not. So uh, on the raw material and fuel, you cannot do anything. But one thing for sure is that why is it the earlier we have the cluster from Jalan Taratai, right? Uh, in Klang. So um, all the glove uh, employ a lot of foreign workers. And where are the workers? Now I want to show you, actually it's also possible to do automation in the glove production, but you must know where. So you look at the glove process, right? So this is a clock. Uh, you start from eight o'clock. 8 o'clock, uh, imagine your clock, your clock, uh, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you start from 8 o'clock, right? Until uh, you departure uh, complete by 7 o'clock. So 8 o'clock is raw material. Uh, so all the raw material come in, you need to do compounding, all right? So you need to control the compounding. Uh, then the dipping line, dipping, you have uh, batch dipping or line dipping, right? Then after dip, you have to strip it. So along the blue color from 8 o'clock to uh, 12 o'clock is already very mature. Yeah? Uh, um, there's not much uh, human, not, not, ma not many, of, you don't need a lot of uh, humans in this operation, right? Because it's very automated, right? But after that, after, after stripping, after stacking, you got to box it. You got to put the glove into the small box and then the small box into the carton. Then from the carton, you're going to put on the pallet. And from the pallet, you have to go to the store. And from the store, you need to load the container. They don't load, they don't load uh, in the glove makers, they do not load by pallet, yeah? Because um, of the pallet, a lot of them is wood. They want to maximize the volume in the container. So they actually have to take the carton one by one and stuff until the whole container is full. One container at least have to, uh, one 40 footer container house around over 3,000 cartons. Yeah. So it would take, it would take uh, maybe four to six people, operator, close to one shift to load one container. So you can imagine there's a lot of labor work. So sometimes they have a few uh, container parked at the loading bay, and then you can see a lot of people pushing the pallet in and pushing pallet out. You know, and then a lot of people are just stuffing in the container. So now you know why uh, Glove Factory, once they get the COVID, they have a lot of people gonna because um, it's still a lot of operator. But it is not impossible to uh, automate this section. Yeah, there are technology available. Welcome to AFA Tech. So I want to show a video. Uh, this is one of our customers. We work very closely with them. Uh, they are into the, uh, the automation part. And some of the one project that I did for them is also related to uh, a tea packaging line, yeah, oversea one. So uh, can be can be quite automated. It all depends uh, what the company willing to do, lah. Technologies. We provide the most advanced packaging automation solution. So this is the conveyor line after the the cuttoning. Uh, so this is for the uh, the the tea company. Uh, overseas. So uh, we did this project, I think it was delivered uh, last year. So, but the similar one, you can do it for the glove and then there are some other glove machines. So let's, let's, uh, let's watch this video. Specifically to gloves, medical devices, and to all FMCG industries. If you are looking for flexible and innovative turnkey solutions for your end of line packaging automation, then you are looking at the right company. The robotic glove stacking machine is able to stack gloves in the exact quantity as required. The benefit of this machine is to fulfill strict demands of precise glove stacking with tolerance as low as plus or minus 10 millimeters. While gloves are stacked nicely in the correct quantity, will be auto transferred to our newly developed machine, examination glove inner boxing machine. 
This machine has earned its own patented design for its capability to support auto loading, auto insertion, and auto tucking, which basically completes the needs for examination gloves automated packing. Surgical Glove Inner Wallet Packaging Machine, FMS 2021B, is highly flexible and equipped with the most advanced technology in the industry. Customers can choose to run between paper or HDPE film packaging material. Online printing or pre-printed rolls are both supported. It packs your gloves gently and precisely with the most presentable form. It ensures 100% glove present on the inner wallet with good quality. It also supports both long and bifold pack with selection on touchscreen. Thermoform fill seal machine with flexographic printer. This machine, working extremely high speed and able to run up to 240 ppm, Observe the web dancer module. With this, it ensures constant tension for the web tensioning and brings high precision printing tolerance as well as the sealing quality. Built-in IO-Link sensors are used to directly communicate with our controller with the sensor's health status and faster communication. Cobot Carton Erector. This Cobot functions as a flexible, safe, and space-saving intelligent carton erector it can support a wide range of carton sizes without any mechanical changeover. Robotic Case Packer. It will then neatly arrange the products and auto-load into the carton boxes with articulated robot. CPMR are highly flexible, but what makes it stand out is its ability for a quick changeover with advanced articulated robot and collaborative robot. Fully Auto Carton Sealing Machine. The cartons are taped and secured, which are then brought onto the sorting conveyor belt towards the vision camera. It has the ability to identify the carton information based on the OCR function and barcode scanning function. Sorting conveyor is able to sort the cartons according to customer-specific needs, such as by customer base, by country, or by SKU. Cobot Palletizer. Once the carton has been sorted at the end of the sorting conveyor, the Cobot Palletizer will load the cartons automatically on the pallet. Autonomous Mobile Robot. These cartons will then be transferred by the Autonomous Mobile Robot, AMR, to their final destination. It has sensors that detect movement and obstacles in their way, which will ease the whole process of your packaging needs and result in a more efficient supply chain for your products. AFA Cloud drives toward a one-stop platform by allowing stakeholders to remote, visualize, monitor, and control, which offers data-driven decisions in the manufacturing process. We continue moving forward with our vision to develop new solutions. So um, <clears throat> um, that, that machine you can see is, um, is using also dashboard yeah, developed. I think there are some participants here from Vtrox, and then they they are working with them also on the dashboard solution. So that uh, that complete line, if the customer need to, can have uh, industrial 4.0, uh, com can comply to industrial 4.0 standard, and you don't need uh, a lot of humans. So in the in the factory, um, you talk about during the pandemic, essential factory or non-essential. Actually, is, is the the meat meat should look at the factory is automated or human more human operator it doesn't matter if you have a lot of uh, 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 um, it's quite automated not not essential you should let it run because the human factor the the the, um, the cluster probability of cluster is a lot less than a lot of in the factory even essential by a lot of people so like um, uh, for example, if you have been to like bottling plant, yeah, beer plant or uh, Coca-Cola plant and all these things, it's just very automated. You go in, you, you just see uh, conveyors and bottle and flying. The, the, you only see the human at the end, you know, maybe some, some loading, unloading. Otherwise, it's very automated. So that kind of thing you should not, uh, doesn't matter whether it's uh, uh, essential or not, it's just, as long as it, it's quite automated, you should give them the license to, the, the permission to operate in that case, right? So anyway, why is why uh, automation is uh, is critical uh, and more tendency will go along this line, partly because of the pandemic. Let's look at our market trend. Market trend 
has changed also. We have like in the uh, of course they are still still available. There is a high mix, uh, so high volume, low mix. That means they produce a similar good by container one size. But at the same time, also have high mix, big size, small size, but small volume. So this is the tendency getting more and more because uh, especially some factory they want uh, they want to uh, capture the market. The market demand, you know, is is different now. So in the uh, um, you must invest correctly, right? You must in invest, uh, you have to look at the business that you are in, whether you need a uh, high, uh, high volume or high mix, low volume right, situation. For example, actually just now you, you see the video, you have, you see the collaborative robot. See the palletizing for high volume, you see the, 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 the robot on the left side, it's very good in some factory when the carton is only one size and then they just keep, producing the same size, so they have a big robot there because of the load also um, uh, to, to do the loading. But of course, when you have a big industrial robot, you have to cage up everything, right? And then um, you're gonna set it permanently for one or two sizes, that's it. But then if your factory have several lines and today I run this line, tomorrow I run different line, and because it's high mix, but the volume is very low, so you do not want to have one big robot which cannot cater for too many uh, product mix. So one way uh, people can consider is using a collaborative robot. This robot, uh, of course, the load is a lot less than industrial robot, but they can be pushed around. You don't need the, the safety cage, right? So you can say, oh, today I run the line one. Tomorrow uh, uh, I need to run line, uh, run line three. So you can move the robot and put it into line three and start the production and because collaborative robot, uh, you don't need this cage because it, it can detect uh, um, you know, accident and stop by itself. So it's very different, right? So this tendency, uh, some of the, fact, uh, um, I think it's FMB, one of the FMB factory, they already adopt this, right? So carton erector, just now we also see the carton, uh, this uh, video from AFA uh, solution, they use a robot to do uh, erection of the carton. You see on the left side, this kind of machine is relatively cheap. I think you can get one 30, 30,000 or something around that price depends on where they come from. You, you put in whole stack of uh, this uh, carton and then it's equal one. But if your production have different sizes or suddenly you run 10 of these then, then five or smaller size, then the carton erector solution is not that flexible. So in order to cater for the high mix, you can look at the collaborative robot. You can put a few sizes of carton in one location. When the uh, uh, when the system detect, oh, I need to run the smaller one, the robot will automatically pick a smaller carton and fold it. So that you can see just now earlier in the video, uh, using collaborative robot to do that. So that flexibility will come in. So it all depends on your business, how dynamic you want it to be, what kind of business you are catering, you're doing. Then you also can see in the trend of logistics and warehouse. So I fortunately about 20 years ago, I did some warehouse project. So you study the warehouse, you go to Ikea, you have this manual wrecking system, so manual. So you have to look and unload one by one manually or by forklift. So when you have forklift running in a warehouse, uh, it's very dangerous because the forklift, you tend to knock things, right? You knock one of the rack and then the whole thing will collapse. I used to maintain, my first job, I used to maintain the fleet of forklift in the factory. I can tell you there's a lot of damages by forklift. So you do not want that also, right? And if you have a, a high volume, this kind of manual warehouse will not work, right? I, I met, I, about 20 years ago, 15, 18 years ago, we did the project, summer, something similar to the one on the lower left, conveyors uh, with barcodes and all these boxes running, pick to light system. Yes, this is uh, quite popular then. But things has changed. Things has changed to more like autonomous uh, uh, robot, you know, robot go around and with all this mobile robot that carry the whole, uh, this, uh, this whole rack. Uh, one of our customers in Penang have something similar robotic solution. They also come up, this is made in Malaysia product. So we're really proud that they have this uh, It's a public listed company. So if you are interested, you can ask me later. So what has changed? More and more, uh, uh, application of uh, 
AGV or uh, autonomous mobile robots will come into the warehouse. Of course, when this, this kind of robot comes in, you need a very good uh, freight management system to manage the robot. You know, uh, uh, you need uh, WMS system, uh, you need probably collaborative robot, um, automatic, automatic uh, pick, pick process, uh, JIT shipment, etc. high flexibility. So let's take one example. I, I'm sure a lot of you order things from Lazada and Shopee, right? And they deliver to your house, right? Do you know that in the center, when all these parcels comes in, they are very different sizes. They are not the kind of product on the left, lower left conveyor system cannot handle because the lower, the conveyor system, what you see on the lower left, they cater for certain carton size, certain weight, huh? because when it's too light, maybe the roller cannot catch it, right? So when you have a system that you are, wow, parcel from this size to that size and all different size, the variation is big. You need a wholly, totally different concept in your warehouse management system, right? So all these, um, uh, I think in US is what they call the name, uh, like Alibaba and all these, uh, Taobao, all these uh, lo local uh, Malaysia, uh, uh, Ninja Van and all these companies, right? How do you want to sort a big pile of products, big and small? It's very difficult. So you need automation. That's why you need the barcode. But the system is already, the technology is already there, whether they want to adopt or not. So you can see if you order something from Lazada, they will tell you where is the, the parcel has been through, right? Because the apps is already so advanced. But at the same time, not just the app, but the system, you need the system to run it so that warehouse automation also have the tendency uh, to cater for uh, high mix, low, low volume uh, kind of uh, transaction. So this also change. Now, <clears throat> that is a lot on factory manufacturing, right? How about people think, oh yeah, well, my, my factory, nothing to do with that. I'm running a water treatment plant or some processed pump with pumps and and oh, just curing oven, what can I do? There's nothing I can do with all this robot, all this stuff, right? There's nothing to do with that, right? I'm running, you know, this kind of pump, but can. What you can do is, uh, yes, you cannot achieve with robots and all these things, but you can make the line more intelligent. How we do that? So there are uh, sensors available. You can uh, mount these to the existing motors because if one of the, 200 kilowatt motor breakdown and something is going to take a long time, you know, to change. And then you have a shortage of, let's say water treatment plant or cooling system, then you have a big problem, right? So you need to have advanced uh, information. You need to predict how the system uh, will operate over the time. So you need something that can measure power supply, uh, current or voltage or resistance or temperature or vibration, you know, while bearing is not doing so well, you know, it's, is the, the over the time the bearing uh, because uh, the people install not correctly so it damaged the bearing so over the time the bearing wear off faster so you start to have the noise and vibration right so you need some sensors only for critical uh, motor you need to do that not not the small half kilowatt thing and then the one you can change easily la. but you're talking about big pumps right then probably you need to um, <clears throat> monitor the the the, the uh, equipment uh, 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 helps helps it you know uh, uh, whether whether it's healthy or not. So oven also you can you can monitor yeah uh, if you are running some oven especially electrical oven you can uh, detect uh, some of the resistant things. So you can have all these linked to the uh, through uh, RS Wi-Fi or what and uh, and uh, it, uh, internet uh, bus uh, IP system through PLC. You can monitor the whole plant the health condition. So even that, even though it's not uh, robotics and all this stuff, you can still make the plant intelligent, especially some uh, system available like uh, in water plant intake, right? It's five kilometers away. They are, they are system like um, RTU and all these uh, G, GSM uh, uh, switches and uh, from people like Moxa, they have this kind of thing. You can capture the signal and make the whole system uh, real time, you know, you can monitor the help real time and you can push even some of these to your mobile phone. These are the technologies already available. It's just a matter of 
whether people want or not. So it's so much so about the, the trend, some of the trend I just mentioned, let's talk about in order to implement what kind of technology you need, right? So uh, of course, um, people always study, you know, I want to do a smart manufacturing. What should I consider? Basically, typically you have to look at three things, the process, your process, the technology that you want, and the organization change, right? So if you don't have a right process, you cannot change your process. Automation cannot help you, uh, I can tell you. If you think uh, in order to, um, if you want to implement a smart system, uh, Industrial 4.0, you have to rethink some of the process flow. But today I, I'm not mentioning too much about the process and organization. I just want to talk about the technology side, right? So the automation, the connectivity, the intelligence side. So um, that is, my business and the left and right is important, but need to study deeper, right? So um, in order to do that, we have to look at the factory. There are three things we need to, to have in order to make the factory uh, smart. The first one, it has to be intelligent enough. Intelligent means your information co uh, communication technology, uh, how you want to link, right? If your current machine is running on uh, relays and some pneumatic uh, logic, then it's very difficult. Uh. So you need to uh, fit in some sensors and, and, and you're able to communicate through some kind of network, right? Because you have many machines. So you need to increase the intelligence of your factory, right? Then uh, you need to in integrate because whatever e equipment, you need to integrate them together. I will talk more about this later. Then best if you can interact Right? So you, you must be able to harmonize the people and the machine. And with this information, then you can achieve this. Uh, I can have a, uh, <coughs> uh, I have, I, I make my machine more intelligent. I can have a, a machine, I can do predictive man, management. Like just now the water pump thing, I just, as an example. So we can have a, a sensory inspection, could be vision, traceability. Right, uh, you need to have some robots to help you to replace a human or every factory, you need some money to push some material in and out one, definitely, unless you have a conveyor system, right? So without a conveyor, the only way around without human is uh, mobile robots. So with this three I, intelligent, integrated, interactive, this is the Omron version of uh, Industrial 4.0, we call it I automation. Yeah, so, um, of course, uh, over the years and people talking about, you know, in a industrial 4.0 uh, seminar, a lot of people are talking about the dashboard and network and all these things. So um, of course you need the floor device. And from there, your PLC controller communicate. And then you have SQL server, how to talk to MES and ERP system and all these things. I'm not so, and then from there, I think this is what I mentioned in a lot of industrial 4.0 a seminar, a lot of talk about how Chang'e is a dashboard, but anyway, this is not our business. Our business is more to do with the AI aspect, IoT aspect, robotic on the field. So this, this one uh, is not our business, but you can consult other people how they can do this better. There are a lot of uh, experts around. So I, I'm not too, I don't want to dwell on this thing too much, but I want to highlight is the integrated part. I want to talk more about integrated of course, at Omron, we come from a company that we uh, categorize our product into in input logic, output robot, and safety. We call it I L O R S, right? So, in order to do automation, um, apart from pneumatics and motors, and basically you need all these things, right? So, to be able to integrate all this together and talk to each other is very important. But um, I am not. In this uh, session, I'm not going to talk how my PLC, how the safety, how output, how sensor. No. I think this stuff you can, uh, you probably all listen a lot already. So I don't want to mention this, but in the, um, uh, I just want to highlight the new way of how you could, you could think of in the future machine design, right? People talk a lot, a lot about this, uh, um, augmented reality and digital twin, right? 
So let me show you one thing you can consider if you are into the machine design uh, business. So I'm not going to talk about automation. If you are joining here, you want to hear more about how servo motor, how is a PLC. Sorry, I'm not talking about this today. Yeah, I just want to share with you in the integration integration part. Uh, this this thing. See, when you design a machine, so I have done this kind of work before, and a lot of public listed company in Malaysia, um, which are doing very well now. Uh, because of the uh, semicon boom, they are making machines in Penang, and some in KL, some in Malacca, and so on, right? So they make a machine. When they make a machine, the process in a lot of these projects, you know, when you design a system or machine, um, the, the, the poor guy is always the programmer. Because the programmer cannot start work until all the mechanical things assemble and wire up, then he can really do his work, right? And if he is doing writing his program before, then he's, he cannot test it. He cannot test his program until everything is ready. So if you look at the uh, um, project scheduling, uh, the poor guy is always the last one because I have been in this business for all right, 20 over years and I've seen my, my colleagues and they are very pressured and have to do all the programming last minute and uh, have to work uh, very late night. So especially this I mentioned to about 18, 17, 18 years ago, we were doing the uh, warehouse project. It was in China and there's a lot of pressure on our team because we have to, we were responsible for the Siemens programming and all this stuff, right? So there was a scrambling like hell, right? The program is, um, uh, the program guy is always the last guy. If the mechanical, the structural guy delay, but the project schedule not delay, no. So when the mechanical delay, they just push back lesser time for the programmer to do his work to troubleshoot, right? So that's the problem. That's the problem. And we can change this. We can change this with the, um, with the software. Um, this, uh, uh, the Omron, the SysMac, uh, platform now you can uh, get the license to do this thing which means that before when okay there are a few things you have to do right? when people design the machine ask you okay you please design this machine uh, before you get the order they need you to give some assurance this machine can do uh, how many ppm the throughput 1000 per hour or something you see this um, you need to do some form of simulation but you cannot do it with 3ds right inventor or whatever because there's no sequence the programming side cannot integrate yet so they just take a guess they calculate okay calculate the estimate ah, can and a lot of pressure comes in the people who make equipment is that the last after they deliver the equipment the debugging getting it perfect to stabilize the quality all these things and performance is where the trouble uh, to a lot of our customer if they did not do the machine correct design correctly then a lot of time uh, they run into some problem because customer may not pay the money and all these things so um, what I'm going to show you is that this new platform is kind of like digital twin you can do this in parallel before you make the machine right so please uh, enjoy the video a bit yeah So this is what it means uh, in when we build a machine there's a planning and concept phase then you design and build then you install right right so you need to verify uh. so a lot of time the real verification come at the end you cannot verify and the programmer is a is a poor guy because he only can do his job at last minute right at the end so <laughs> So we've got to change this and let's need to do a lot.
in the actual um, machine design uh, uh, um, manufacturing process, um, this is what the programmer will do in the end, right? He has to verify the robot that he designed and, and the reach and everything. So he has to manually test it and verify everything with the actual movement. So with, with the SysMac platform that uh, we have and we have this software, uh, you just have to purchase this software. Then what you do is uh, you, um, you can take your 3D design and then put in your program and you verify before you make it. pre-verification of the process. So when you design a concept like this using the 3D and then, then you write, really write the program to simulate this, you can cut down the uh, verification process. Uh, in this uh, presentation, this video shows you about 32%. Uh, so you, you can reduce your risk because when you design the equipment, you have a lot of risk, right? So if the design itself is, the concept is wrong, I can tell you this whole project becomes scrap metal. You can throw it away. Then you, you, the customer will not pay you money. So this is, this is an issue, right? So here you can uh, uh, make the verification and then oh, not only that, but also can make it faster. So one thing is that <clears throat> the programmer, the guy who is doing the 3D design and the software engine, they can work together. Right, it can work simultaneously instead of oh, this one finish, only this one take over. Now you, you can run almost parallel. Right, mm -hmm. this is the advantage. Yeah. So in the end, if you compare the two process until you finish, there's a lot of saving. The only difference is you must um, do a, a reasonable 3D design and more detail in order for the programmer to work. Of course, it can involve servo motor and some pneumatic functions and all these things and robotics, right? So in the end, it's actually uh, you reduce the risk and reduce a lot of your design cost and error. So um, yeah, that is the inter. So um, <clears throat> uh, that I, I will not talk about all these other vision and all these barcode stuff. I just want to mention how the design uh, element can be integrated in the, the programming side, can be integrated into the machine design together so you can reduce the, 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 the error and the time. Yeah, that's very important. So last is uh, interactive. Uh, of course, uh, in uh, uh, whatever the system you put in, you must be able to interact easily, right? Mobile robot, how you want to teach it, how how the mobile robot is going to uh, uh, go around people and collaborative robot uh, programming. The one that we are uh, showing is very easy. You just pull the robot and then do the teach function. Relatively straightforward. So I will not elaborate detail, but I want to show you this, this interactive part. You see, not all factory can, not all 
production process you can automate. This is a fact. Even Omron itself, our like production of sensors, some of these tiny PCB you want to install into the, uh, the sensor is still very manual, right? The, raw, the automation to some extent, but somehow it is too complicated, could be too slow or too expensive. You want to automate 100%. So we must live with the fact that not everything can be automated. Huh? So in, in the area that where you have a lot of, you, you cannot avoid. So one way is that you can have a kind of a, a smart semi system that you use a vision system. So in, in, in this way, you have a human assist production. Uh, yes, there's still robot here to, to move things. Yeah, uh, collaborative robot to help the, the, the operator to do some function, but some assembly function can, cannot avoid. So what you can, you can do is that you have a vision system here. You can uh, compare a guy that is a uh, new operator that's new, and then this uh, experienced operator. Then from here, you can detect the, uh, um, the time, how fast they move. So the intelligence of that, and then you can, can take this and make improvement and make uh, get this guy to work more efficiently. So some form of human assist uh, production system to interact is still uh, possible because uh, we cannot automate 100% everything. So this is a video about this uh, Omron factory. Uh, this is in, I think it's Kusatsu. I went to this factory before. So we have the mobile robot in the production line, right? So this video don't have a sound. So any factory, there is always somebody will push some material forward and come and back. Uh, raw material come in and finish goods out, right? So you need, so can you imagine you have uh, one guy pushing, there are a lot of people want to push trolley around the factory. You go to any electronic factory, you see a lot of people pushing things around. So this one, you can uh, replace a human with a mobile robot. So, so yeah, this is one, one example. Uh, let me show you other examples. Uh, this is the um, electronic factory. Uh, instead of human, again, uh, this is very common in some of the uh, 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 electronic factory in the country. I've seen a lot of these. So there are some people pushing trolley around, right? So you can get the robot at the designated time or you can call the robot the material is low so the, the robot can 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 uh, come and uh, you know stop at the designated place supply the goods to, to the operator so the color can take this uh, uh, the box or something like that right so some of these also uh, you can oh so sorry so, deliver goods finish goods now you you start the robot okay go away you see so you can uh, So it also can go in. You need to go integrate with the lead control. Yeah. Okay, of course, some uh, factory, I think this one we took it in the semi a couple of years ago. So you can have a robot to deliver a goods and, uh, you know, a trolley or something, then uh, this, this, Cut transporter go away <clears throat> and then this is what we call the um, manipulator with the arm so the the robot on top is a collaborative robot right <clears throat> so the robot will pick the whatever the magazine right transport to the this is the drop off point yeah from the drop off point can go into the machine so this one we did just i think we did it in half a day or something after we talked to mobile they let us to use our robot in the exhibition to do the loading, unloading. There's no mechanical interference whatsoever, yeah? There's no mechanical interference. So we just, just reprogram the robot in the exhibition hall and we just show them this. There's a lot more and more demand for this kind of thing to replace human, 
right? Of course, uh, there are uh, cases like, oh, okay, uh, this is also very common. Uh, there are a lot of uh, existing factory, there are a lot of trolleys. So how, how, how they don't want to modify their thousands of trolleys. So what we can do is you can customize uh, this kind of robot, right? So this robot is a more customized and then this, this is an existing trolley, right? So this is a half ton, it's a half 500 kilogram. So you just go in, clamp the whole trolley and go away. And then this is the drop-off sequence. So this is a more customized. This is uh, so. This is I think this is uh, this is this product is patented. Yeah. So you can do in a one point three meter hour. So it's most of the factory floor we have. We got in the clean room environment, right? So. The, the, the aisle is very narrow, under 1.5 meter one. You know? So you have to consider all these factors, yeah. So these are the things available in the, in the, uh, available, the technology already available, just uh, need to adapt, yeah. So let's show a very ideal, uh, flexible. Uh, sorry, Mr. Lee, I need again. Sorry, Mr. Lee, I need to interrupt you because uh, time is actually running short. So Welcome to the fun. factory of the... Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing yeah. already. Yeah, I do finish it. Thank you. It's fully adaptive and modular. integrated inspection systems combined with technology to enable serialization and traceability ensure error-free products. We have access to the most relevant data in real time, helping optimize the production line. The AI controller provides machine learning on the edge, increasing machine uptime. It detects abnormal behaviors in real time to predict product and equipment failure. Factory that is intelligent, integrated, and interactive. So, um, so uh, coming to the uh, end part, the golden question is: After all these things, is uh, how do you want to justify this investment? is always a golden question. Of course, uh, for us to make a decision, basically there are many other reasons, uh, there are different needs, but typically you can look at the three, three main things, uh, brand protection, uh, sustainability, and operational excellence. What it means is uh, in brand protection, why you want to implement automation or industrial four or make your line more intelligent is you want to reduce your uh, risk to consumer or your um, uh, impact, some of this impact, maybe uh, uh, your, your failure caused some accident or something on, and traceability problem that affect your quality. So you want to protect your brand, just like if you find a chicha in your McDonald's Big Mac, right? So it's really bad uh, press for McDonald's, this kind of stuff, right? So you, you want to do it because of brand protection. So this one very hard to put a dollar sign over it, yeah? Some you want to do it because you want to keep your business, uh, you want to sustain your business. So you, you, your customers uh, uh, demand, you know, uh, zero defect or you want customer demand robotics. Uh, if you don't do it in such way, you cannot get their business. So you want to sustain your business. So you have no choice, you do it. Or you do it to reduce the energy consumption or waste you know, for environmental reason. Of course, operational excellence at, you know, uh, it's more for like, uh, how do you save money, uh, cut production costs or reduce manpower? There are, there are many different reasons, but you got to find a reason why you do it. Now, coming to the end and combine all this together, what do we expect in the possible change? I've been saying that the, the change is inevitable one. So right now we look at the global supply chain is very globalized, right? 
So you just look at Malaysia itself. Because of a COVID, right? People are uh, the cheap supply firm urged to shift production from Malaysia to China because of the co co uh, uh, pandemic issue in Malaysia, right? Our factory, Southeast Asia, our COVID surge worsened the car chip shortage in US because of some of these chips we cannot ship. Uh, some of the American car they have to stop uh, selling or uh, they have to reduce their consumption. The, 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 the uh, factory cars, they cannot uh, sell, they cannot compete because of lack of chips. So what is possible to expect in the future? Maybe more decentralization. Some company may have to look at their process. For example, uh, the chip shortage also affect us. A lot of people who in the control business. So maybe because uh, in the past, like Toyota, they look at JIT process. Maybe they said, yeah, the pandemic is not going to go away. So maybe they want to increase their, uh, um, the, the buffer stock or something. Maybe the process will change. Will government policy change? Perhaps, right? Some government will change the policy. Uh, Malaysia, I'm not so sure because we just changed the government. <laughs> but definitely one thing is for sure, the automation level will go up because people want to depend less on human because human also create what I mentioned, uh, this uh, cluster come from human, right? So if you have a factory very automated, then you have a lesser problem. How about human? Human development problem, I can assure you, because of the pandemic in the next these two years, <clears throat> our next, our generation Z that will be graduating from the university entering the workforce, we may have to consider the human uh, factor retraining them because the engineers have been sitting at home and doing online training. They have no, no, no uh, lack of uh, workshop and interaction with people. I can tell you these people in two, if the next year or so you start to employ these people, as an as a, uh, employer or, or superior, you have some, you start to face a problem and maybe some kind of uh, retraining is required. So this uh, pandemic uh, have uh, cultivated a different kind of uh, generation. Unfortunately, we have to accept, we cannot keep uh, thinking about the past. So last, last words, um, Omron, we have a principle is to continuously uh, improve lives and uh, contribute to a better society. So we try to do our part if we can in, uh, in any way. So I just want to show you a very recent uh, projects we did um, <clears throat> with the University uh, Bahang, Malaysia. Uh, unfortunately, it was delayed because of the pandemic. <clears throat> this is the <clears throat> uh, system that we put in uh, together with them with robots. Uh, uh, with collaborative robots and, you know, I'll show you a little bit of video. They have an ASRS system and all these things. So I will not, this is part of the uh, work that we constantly look into uh, on the education side to bring innovation to society and to contribute them. So if you, uh, you want to know more, uh, you can contact uh, Mr. Ghazali. This is his handphone. Uh, he also uh, keen to know about some, um, uh, some trend in the industry. If you so kindly take down this number and contact him if you can, and then ask about this project. Yeah, he's doing some research in this area. Probably he can help you. So these are the things that we're constantly looking for uh, in the next couple of years. We also hope that some of the things I just mentioned can help to uh, educate our uh, young uh, stu our students, our uh, engineers in the future. So last, there are many reasons. We just have to find the reason, the right justification for your, the right justification for your investment. Do you need to uh, uh, make some changes because of uh, environment, uh, because of high mix, low volume, and because of human problem? These are the reasons you have to find out according to the process. Um, if you want to ask me more than that, this is my email address. You can always uh, uh, send an email to me if you need some, you have some questions. Other than that, uh, that's all. Huh? Thank you very much for your attention. If you have uh, questions, uh, you can ask me now. Or if not, you can post a question to uh, Marisa.
thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Uh, that was very um, informative and insightful, I believe, because we do have um, some questions um, from the floor, but we will address them shortly after Dr. Chua's um, brief talk. Okay, so to everyone who are still here, thank you very much for staying until the end of the session. And we actually um, have Dr. Chua from Malaysian Smart Factory. He's the head of um, MSF 4.0 from AC Charizzi. He has, um, he would like to talk uh, very briefly on what we're doing. So please, um, Dr. Chua, you may take your time. So please stay uh, for a little bit longer. So you, guys, so you guys can hear what we have to offer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Marisa. Uh, Okay, uh, a very good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for joining in today. And thank you very much, Mr. Lee uh, from Omron that uh, provide us with very, very good um, insights on the smart manufacturing trends. So I'm just going to take a short 10 minute um, probably to just um, share with everybody here today on uh, what we are doing at the Malaysian Smart Factory. Uh, Omron is one of our uh, technology partners and uh, we are very, very grateful for all their support uh, throughout uh, our journey in the Malaysian Smart Factory. We are going to turn three years old this month, right? Uh, at the end of the month, we will be celebrating our third year anniversary. And uh, this is something that we want to uh, offer to support the industries and community in this space as well. So um, for those who have not visited the Malaysian Smart Factory before, um, we actually have um, a model factory set up. Uh, Omron was one of the, the uh, initial partners that helped us in terms of the setup of the space, right? That's why you see a very nice Omron arm over there and also the, um, you know, the autonomous intelligent vehicle that we also work with them on. So the Malaysian Smart Factory right now, we are unable to open up uh, but uh, physically, but we do have a virtual tour. So if you do want to have a look, we, we you have a link over here that you can explore. Now in the Smart Factory, uh, we do a lot of, um, you know, initiatives to help the industry and also technical institutions uh, and also universities and colleges, uh, we always support on a more talent development perspective, uh, basically um, helping the industries and community to move towards a more sustainable digital transformation. So as what uh, Mr. Lee has shared on all the smart manufacturing trends, you know, what is out there and, you know, there is a lot of potential for many industries to grow in this space uh, more organically, right, and more sustainably, right? So we actually help industries um, to digitize or to achieve a more sustainable transformation through a more talent development approach. So we break down into five levels of maturity, right? Uh, in which this is how we actually deliver our programs. Uh, it is designed in such a way where um, it is brand independent, it is scalable, it is flexible, and it is modular enough for you to explore, right? The technologies, and we have had industries that, um, you know, have implemented what we have taught them in our programs. So this is areas where you can explore um, if you are keen to you know, adopt technologies like Omron and also work on developing um, you know, technology applications such as dashboarding. If you're looking at developing your own OEE uh, platform, right? Uh, this is actually an area where, where we can actually um, you know, support this um, you know, initiative, right? Uh, to help you to build uh, dashboards like this. Um, you know, if you want to scale up from one machine to multiple machines, these are actually able to um, explore expansion, right? Uh, through the programs that you actually learn, right? And of course, you want to visualize your data. You want to see what is actually happening in your ecosystem. Um, you know, you can definitely learn how to implement all these tools through programs that we run. So you may be using an Omron PLC. You may be using an Omron product. You may be using other products as well. It doesn't matter. Right? Because most importantly is how we connect um, devices together and how we actually help to scale up. Right? So this is an example of how uh, an Omron servo motor is connected to our system right? uh, you know, and, and how it's actually monitoring in real time. Right? Uh, and this is where we actually implemented predictive analytics and predictive maintenance uh, work on an Omron motor like this. Right? So you can actually see in real time, it is actually uh, clocking in at 100 milliseconds right, uh, sample rate, and uh, we're actually visualizing anomaly detection on this, right, this is one of part of our programs under data analytics that you can learn how to implement this kind of systems, this kind of monitoring systems, and this is actually an area that, you know, we can help industries and also the um, uh, institutions to adopt, 
right? Uh, and what has been shared by Mr. Lee as well, when we talk about digital factory and digital twin, right? This is actually uh, one of our upcoming programs that we are going to launch sometime in um, October or November, right? So this is a sneak preview for everybody, right? Uh, in which we talk about the digital factory or digital manufacturing. So this is uh, one of the programs that we are going to launch. Uh, it is also very much uh, a brand neutral kind of concept. Uh, there's a lot of Omron libraries if you're using an Omron Robotics. I saw that there's a comment asking about how will you do simulation, you know, for, for AIBs or, or any other product. This is a, an area where we are supporting, right, uh, how to communicate with product simulation and so on. So this, uh, we will be launching this program sometime October, November. So if you're keen, you know, let us know, um, you know, in the chat as well, right. Uh, so these are the range of progress that we deliver. Uh, we, we run uh, a technical overview for a senior management team, usually, right? This is actually an area where we demystify Industry 4.0 and Smart Factory. Uh, technical programs from level one to level five, we have a range of them, right? Uh, especially in data automation, right? So if you are looking at collection of data from your machines, you know, you have legacy machines, you have, um, you know, uh, uh, interfaces that you want to collect data from, uh, data generation is a program for you, right? We also run uh, various PLC, um, you know, essentials, uh, IoT gateway, cyber physical system, IOLink technologies are some of our other programs that we run as well. So if you're looking at, you know, the more system integration pathway, this is actually an area that you can explore, right? So uh, right now at SHRDC, we actually have already set up what we call as a remote training facility, right? So whether you are at home or you are at your office, you are at your factory, uh, you can actually log into any of our machines, right? And do your training programs uh, directly, uh, you know, at the comfort of your home or at your office or your factory, right? So, so uh, we are launching uh, some programs. Uh, basically, we have quite a number of programs going to run from the month of September all the way to October, right? And we have a promotion at the moment, right? So if you are keen to explore on this uh, buy one, free one promotion, um, do get in touch with us. Uh, we will share with you the training schedule and then you can come and join us definitely, right? So uh, we also have a lot of learning resources, right? Uh, where you can explore uh, some of the technology programs that we have, um, you know, and also look at our collaborations with Omron, um, you know, and, and these are areas that we can support you through all the way, right? So with that, that's my very, very quick presentation, right? And I think now we can move on to Q&A, Marisa. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, um, Dr. Chua. So uh, for now, I will just share again my uh, share my screen again. Uh, and now we're opening the floor for a Q&A session, which I have collected uh, some of the questions that the audience had asked and dropped in the chat box. So this one, I believe it should be for Mr. Lee. So this one is from Hussein Al-Faiz. He is asking, are there any plans for solid state battery development in Malaysia? Oh. Okay, okay. I, I don't know any I don't know uh, any of this kind of project, but I do know that the battery technology is very well guarded secret. You know, everyone trying to out outdo each other. So our current battery that I know is still not there yet. You know, so now somebody talking about some graphite thing and all these things. I think it still come. But as far as Malaysia concerned, I think we don't have that volume and manufacturing. Uh, that I know of, lah. not that I know of. That's why I said in the EV uh, sector, uh, it's Malaysia part is more to play with the automotive electronics. Lah. The battery technology so far that I don't know any. Lah. Yeah, yes. All right, yeah. and he actually has a second. Yeah, not from Omron anyway. Lah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the second question from Hussein as well, uh, he is asking, are there any demands in augmented reality application in Malaysia's industrial sector? Oh, probably Dr. Cha can answer that better. For the, um, for our focus, uh, we the, just now the software I just mentioned, that would definitely help a lot of our customer who are into uh, machine making uh, business equipment making business by using that because you need the, the software to um, to design the machines uh, that will help a lot in reduce the risk and, and uh, the uh, assessment point of view but for a bigger picture like plant building and all these things uh, as I mentioned uh, it's beyond our 
uh, focus uh, and our expertise for time being. So I cannot answer too much. Maybe Ms. Dr. Chua can answer that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so in terms of uh, augmented, augmented reality for manufacturing, I think it really depends on your... Uh, it really depends on what application that you're really looking at, right? Um, you know, when we talk about augmented reality, that, that it could be for maintenance, it could be for actually a guided operator uh, approach, right? Because uh, usually these kind of technologies are used to minimize errors, right, for operators. So like instead of them, instead of you teach once, then you have to stand there and monitor them the whole time, you know, whether augmented reality can actually help in that sense, right? Uh, some of them actually look at uh, the combination of augmented and virtual, which is what we call as mixed reality, to help in terms of this kind of maintenance strategy. So this is something where, you know, uh, it is booming, right? Uh, the usage, usage of smart glasses uh, and so on, which is something we are exploring as well. So, um, you know, if, if there are any uh, industries or company that want to explore with us, yeah, we, this is something that we can do with you as well. No problem. Next question. You have to on your mic. Oh, sorry. Oh, my bad. All right. So the next question is from Wan Mujtahidin. He, I think this one is from Mr. Lee. He was asking, in the video just now, I see an articulated robot and cobot works together in a smart packaging system. Can you explain what is the selection criteria for us to choose articulated robot versus cobot? Oh, okay. Um, the reach and the load is very one key area that you can consider. But when you consider collaborative robot, it's strictly because you do not want to have the cage, right? You don't want to have safety cage and you have human very close to the robot, but do not expect high load capacity and high acceleration load. This is a criteria. If you have all these things, then better go back to industrial robot. Because collaborative robot in the market, the biggest that I know of is 20 kilo. The model that we have is up to about 14 only. But I think there's another brand that can go up to 20 kilo. That's about it. If you are talking about 200 kilo, 100 kilo, load, then, then collaborative robot is not a selection for you. So you, you can send an email to us if you have more... Uh, Questions are probably I cannot answer all here in this session, but you can send a mail to me later. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, for your question, uh, one. So the next question we have is from Nick Shahwim. He's asking: Is it possible to simulate the smart manufacturing layout that includes cobot? Uh, I'm not sure. A AGV, a vision, and RFID in order to evaluate the performance before implementation. Uh, probably not 100% everything you want all into together. I think it's not that smart until that level yet. But the mobile robot, the one I just showed you, the platform is very good on the machine design. Uh, the mobile robot is a different entity. So, so far we have not reached that level yet. So the one that I just mentioned is about machine design and some robots, uh, but not to the extent of like uh, barcode and all these things yet. Yeah. But you can you can simulate that separately, right? You, you can test because usually when we look at vision system or barcode and all these things, we need to do a feasibility test. So that that you're already out of picture. But this, the one that I just show on the software is more on the machine sequence, you know, performance, the robot, the pneumatics, the servo motor, and all this stuff. I hope that after, if you can you you can send me a mail if you have. Uh, you are not clarified because I think today, because we have a very short time, you can answer, I answer as much as I can here. No worries. Um, so I have already included your email um, in the chat box so everyone can see if they have more queries or questions. Okay, so um, we have last two questions here. Um, this one is from Walmart Yusri. He's asking, can you share the application of Omron Cobot in Malaysia's industrial sector? And does Omron provide any professional certificate related to cobot operation? Oh, cobot actually is the one that we have is very easy to use. Uh, you don't really need a very specific certification. 
Uh, if you know, you can teach and, and, and the programming is through a flowchart is different from the, a lot of other people want. So uh, it comes, somehow it comes with the vision. So, uh, so far we don't have, but it's okay. We can give some kind of certificate for that. Yeah. But for application that we have done so far is on pick and place without safety cage uh, because they, they um, some industry, they need something not fast, but very close to human. So we have some of these application, uh, like the pelletizing one, you, I just showed in some of the video, um, uh, is, is our project here. So, but I cannot just, I need permission to, in order to show, show some of this picture, unless this is already available in the YouTube. Yeah. But you can write to me, uh, you can, we, can, we can advise you some of these things, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Lee. All right, so this one is from Ng Guan. He's asking, do you have any experience or project in steel industry or manufacturing? Oh, mm, steel. Uh, traditionally, steel mill is like big rollers and big motors and all these things. Um, lesser in the kind of automation that we do. Uh, so if you want to have like, um, uh, make your plant smarter, it will be along the way at what I just mentioned about con con monitoring the big pumps and big motor because um, it's not impossible, but as long as you know in the factory what you want, uh, it's just a smaller pump and a bigger pump, the, the difference is there, but the, the principle of control from one manufacturing to the other is more or less the same. Yeah, the control principle, but of course we have no particular experience in uh, in the steel factory in record, but most of our focus is in the manufacturing, but I don't think that is difficult to move on, but we have, I personally have a lot of experience in the, uh, also in the water treatment uh, aspect, so I can I can relate to what some of the uh, filter bed pumps and, and you know, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't think it's that, that difficult, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lee. So uh, we have a new question here from Ridwan. He is saying, hi all, I am Ridwan here from UTHM Johor. He wants to ask Omron regarding the training kit from Omron, Omron that easy for students to learn and play with Omron products. Uh, we have some standard kits, but um, <clears throat> uh, these are uh, this, this, uh, for fundamental learning on PLC and some uh, some motors and all these things. But I think we have to move away to prepare the student for a more advanced uh, manufacturing things like what we did with SHRDC and UMP. And we plan to do some more in the coming years. In fact, our, we are just talking to Dr. Chua. We are also planning in three years ahead, uh, what can we contribute to change this landscape rather than you know, in the past, a lot of uh, Omron uh, training kit is CP1E, is the ladder diagram, but we, we are moving from there to a SysMac platform uh, that is more intelligent and easier to connect to Industrial 4.0, Ethernet, and all this stuff, right? So we need to change that. So, um, yeah, things, as I mentioned, uh, the, the trend is changing, so we have to catch up. So if you are looking at some uh, education-related thing, yeah, we can discuss, yeah. Uh, I can't explain all in this session, but yeah, welcome to have this discussion with me, yeah. Thank you very much for your question, Aridwan, and Ms. Lee for your answer. So this is the final question, all right? This, uh, but this one is anonymous um, attendee um, using the Q&A function. So this person is asking, how visual components can help in Industry 4.0? Does it have uh, VR features? Which one? Vision. Uh, uh, How well components can help in Industry 4.0? Does what, it have? What component? Oh, I, I think Mr. Lee, this is, uh, this is uh, regarding the sharing that I did just now, I think. Uh, oh, okay. Mr. Lee. Yeah, yeah. So uh, visual components is um, one of the um, uh, digital factory software uh, that is available. How it can help uh, in terms of Industry 4.0, uh, there are many, many areas that it can support. Uh, if you are keen to explore that, 
uh, we, we actually just did a very uh, quick webinar session uh, recently um, on, on this uh, digital factory. Uh, I will share the link inside the chat and you can review that as well. Uh, and th these are actually um, a platform where you can actually look at a digital factory simulation. And uh, yes, it can also connect to VR if, if you are keen and interested to look at. Uh, these are actually part of the new program that we are launching. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you, we also have connection to VR for, for this particular uh, tool that we are using and teaching. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Chua. Um, I'm sorry, because that, that question was from an anonymous attendee. Uh, looks like the, mention is not named, um, the name is not mentioned here. Okay, so I think that is all for our Q&A session for today. And I believe I have already launched a quick poll on which everyone should um, be able to see and prompt it on your screen. So please answer those questions for those who haven't. And thank you very much for attending for today's session. But before we just wrap up for today, just give us a uh, May I just... Uh... Yep answer some questions I saw in the chat, we will not answer earlier. So sorry, just now the Kuantan uh, company, yes, is VAC. I talk, uh, mentioned the wrong name. So uh, Inche Hussein just uh, corrected me. Yes, VAC, I have a good friend there, still working there, a long time friend. So uh, regarding uh, EV, yes. Okay, um, Mr. Chun is talk about the EV. Um, we have yes, Malaysia will be slow because I if you plan to buy EV, I would put it off for some more years because our movement, our national automotive policy and our ministry they are moving very slow in implementation of EV. So uh, PEV is still people um, plug-in vehicles still people very hesitate. Yeah, very concerned about battery life. Uh, these are the thing uh, I just mentioned. Uh, Blah, blah, blah. I think the rest already answered. Okay, you have any further question? Please uh, uh, send to my email. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Uh, once again, for all attendees here, I have included Mr. Lee's um, direct mailbox, uh, which is uh, you can see that from my reply. All right, in the chat box. So once again, just a recap from what Dr. Chua has mentioned on in regards to our data automation training programs that we are offering currently throughout this month of September and October. All right, we have data generation, data formulation, OEE. All right, so you can just um, refer to this poster and check our Facebook because uh, we do update this regularly. All right, and for those who may be interested, uh, today at 3 p.m., we also have a webinar session on footwear technology with Mr. Ken Chan at 3 p.m. All right, so this is a totally a free webinar. So do um, ask us for the link or head over to our Facebook page, which I have already shared the link. Okay, um, and do get in touch with ACHRDC. So this is our, all our available um, social media channels. So you can DM us or WhatsApp us or anything regarding our programs. Um, do get in touch with us, all right? And uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your time. And my apologies for and dragging it more than around 15 to 20 minutes than the initial um, time. <laughs> for, um, but I do hope that all of you guys will en um, did enjoy this session with Mr. Lee and Dr. Chua. Okay, so that is all for me. From me, thank you very much to Mr. Lee for joining us and giving your um, your talk. Okay. So the, yes, um, to ISHA, uh, yes, and uh, the e-certificate, um, we call it webinar e-batch. You will receive it via email, all right? So after this session, so someone, our team will organize that for you and you will, everyone will receive a webinar e-batch from us, okay? So thank you very much for, uh, to everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day and stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Elvin, Dr. Chua, Munis, and Mr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Have you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. So how was it, everyone? Did you enjoy and learn something new today? We hope you find the webinar beneficial and informative. Thank you for sitting through until the end of the webinar session with us. If you like what you have experienced today and want to join in for more sessions, do not forget to like and follow our social media channels. 
Simply search SCHRDC on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, as all of our programs are regularly updated there. We will include the links to these pages in the description box below. Feel free to connect with us today or visit our website at www.shrdc.org.my. Thank you, and we hope to see you again.